Luke 22, Luke 22. And uh, as we continue on in that Thursday time period, uh, predominantly from the Roman calendar, but also uh, now into the Jewish calendar, we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ going through the various uh, trials uh, at the hand of man that culminate in the cross, the trial by God the Father, where he is judged for our sins. But leading up to that, he went through much persecution, and that's what we're starting to note uh, in these trials. And tonight we pick it up with the third trial that Jesus Christ is going to face at the hands of the overall Jewish religious council called the Sanhedrin. And so in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 66 through 71, which is the last section of chapter 22, we have the narrative in regard to this third trial that Luke gives to us. And really only Luke gives us a great detail, or some detail I should say, of what occurred during this trial and certainly the important aspects of it and how once again our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is delivering the gospel message to those who are lost and dying in this world even when they reject him and refuse to believe upon him he still gives them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and in the response that our Lord uh, gives uh, in this narrative, he once again gives the gospel to the entire council, giving them all an opportunity to be saved based on belief in him as their Savior and as their Messiah. So as I said, this is the third trial. There were six altogether at the hands of man. This will be the last one by the Jews and the Jewish council. And then from here, we will start to begin the study of Pilate and Herod trying our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we recognize in this trial is that now because the first two trials, the one uh, before the previous high priest named Annas, who was the father-in-law of the current high priest named Caiaphas, as Jesus Christ went before Annas and then Caiaphas, both of those trials and questionings were done during the nighttime, and therefore they were disqualified as uh, being legal uh, and up, uh, being upheld by the Jewish law as something that they then could enact a sentence upon. Instead, they were illegal trials, and now they had to come before the entire Sanhedrin in the daylight in order to have an appropriate trial of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, because these first two trials, as I said, were held by night, they were illegal trials according to the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is really what we have that was written in the 3rd century A.D., so after Christ, about 300 years after Christ, as the Jews had been dispersed throughout the world at this point in time, Jerusalem having been destroyed by the Roman army uh, during the uh, 70 A.D. Uh, invasion or the rebellion by the Jews and then destruction uh, by the Romans of the temple and the tabernacle and then its further destruction that occurred around 123 A.D. And because of the diaspora of the Jews, now what they had to do was take what used to be passed down orally as how to apply the law of Moses to the people and to everyday society. There was a whole section of that that was typically orally passed down from generation to generation. And now as they're being dispersed, they decided around 300 A.D. to write these things down and now capture the oral law as it were. And that document is what we call the Mishnah. Since then, there have been some additional things added to it. I've talked about this in the past. But when we look at the Mishnah, and as they were applying the law of Moses in regard to trials and jurisdiction, we see more definition in the Mishnah, which was the application of the Mosaic Law on a consistent basis. And in regard to that, there's one section, particularly in the Mishnah, called the Sanhedrin 4.1, that can be translated or uh, recognized as saying, let a capital offense be tried during the day, but suspended at night. Or, in cases of capital law, the court judges during the daytime and concludes the deliberations and issues the ruling only in the daytime. You see, if it was a civil case, they could have done that at night, but when it had to do with a capital crime, uh, calling for a capital punishment, as this one was, where they wanted to stone Jesus Christ to death, 
Ultimately, they had to perform this during the daytime in order for it to be legitimate. And therefore, because they did the other things at night, they were not able to rely on those solely. So now they put the whole council of the Sanhedrin together to have the trial of Jesus Christ during the daytime by the entire council. When we come back on Thursday night, I'm actually going to share with you uh, over 18 points that show from the Mishnah and the Law of Moses how this trial, all three of these trials of Jesus Christ at the hands of Jews were against the law. So it's very interesting and very, you know, somewhat comical how they illegitimized their own trials and broke their own rules and regulations, broke the law in order to bring this sentence about on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, again, I'm sure I could do a lot of current day commentary with that. I'll try to hold myself back in that, okay? But it's amazing how they were breaking their own law to make it effective to get rid of this guy over here called Jesus Christ because he was a threat to their fiefdom and to their religion and to their politics as well. So in any case, let's go into our scriptures and read the text. Let's look at the Luke chapter 22, now in verse 66. <clears throat> and down into verse 71. And as I said, Luke gives us the most detail of the other gospel accounts. The others kind of just mention it. I'm going to share those with you in a minute. But in verse 66, it says, When it was day... The council of elders of the people assembled both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, and again, remember, Christos, the anointed one, which also meant that he was the Messiah, that he would be the Savior. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of, of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, Yes, I am. Again, one of those powerful I am statements once again. Then in verse 71, And they said, What further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So again, because of what Jesus Christ said, said that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, the Anointed One, and he would be seated at the right hand of God the Father, they called him blasphemous at that point in time and said, what more do we need to hear? Let's get rid of him right now. So we see in Luke's Gospel that being uh, defined for us with a little bit more definition. But as I said, any findings of guilt at these first two night trials would have been null and void because, again, they were happening under the cover of darkness when, again, even according to their own oral law, again, the oral Torah, as it's also called, they uh, were breaking their own rules and therefore it would not be a legitimate trial. And if they had to stand up, especially in front of their own people in sorcery, saying, how could you accuse this guy and condemn him in the nighttime and do away with him? Isn't that against the law? They would have had no excuse. So again, to cover themselves, now they're having a daytime trial and they're doing it in front of the whole Sanhedrin. What we see about this section as we continue to set it up is that it's paralleled in Matthew 27 verses 1 and 2, the first part, and Mark chapter 15, 1 per se. You see both of those uh, uh, passages talk about going before the council. John doesn't write about going before the council at all. John actually just wrote Annas, Caiaphas, and then write to Pilate. So he didn't even mention the council, but these two mentioned the council as they went from Caiaphas to the council and then to Pilate. I'm going to show you that real quickly. But what is interesting, and as I've mentioned to you before, what Luke writes in the narrative of what occurred during this third trial before the council these questions, are you the Christ, tell us now, and Jesus' response, actually Matthew and Mark give that a little bit earlier during what Matthew and Mark defined as the trials before Annas and Caiaphas. But remember, as I've said to you, they've kind of written the first three trials as an amalgamation of one. 
and basically just blended it all in and don't really give the de uh, specifics about is he before this one or that one or the entire group. But the questioning that we see here is paralleled in Matthew 26, Mark 14. And John, uh, as I said, doesn't speak about it at all, but just says he goes right to Pilate in John 18, 28. Let me show you those couple of scriptures uh, that give the parallel. Later on, we'll talk about uh, the wording that is used. But in Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. So as you can see, Matthew doesn't talk about how they found him guilty and the questioning back and forth and Jesus' response, just that they conferred together and found him guilty and led him off to Pilate. Mark says something similar, Mark 15, 1. Early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So there we have to assume they found him guilty in that trial so that ultimately they could bring him before uh, Pilate in order to have him destroyed. <clears throat> then we also see in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 28, it says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium. So again, boom, boom, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the Praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. We've talked about the hypocrisy of that. I chuckle every time, these uh, you know, arrogant SOBs and uh, hi uh, hypocrites. Oh, I can't go into a Gentile building because I'll defile myself before the Passover, and I won't eat the Passover. So let's kill Jesus so we can go and eat the Passover. Amen. Okay? Let's do it. Okay? I mean, just unbelievable how these uh, people think. But that's what evil does. That's what Satan does. That's what Satan's cosmic system does. So now as we come back and break it down, and I want to go through verse by verse. In verse 66, as it says, When it was day, or at daybreak, the council of the elders of the people assembled both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chambers, saying, and so again, they bring him before the entire Sanhedrin. Now the entire council is gathered together. Many of these individuals were already at the trial, uh, excuse me, the arrest of Jesus Christ in the middle of the night, but they had to gather some more of them together and now have them all together to have this third trial. So, you know, again, in the middle of the night, maybe everybody wasn't up and able to be awake for the arrest of Jesus Christ. Some of them also, as we know, uh, like uh, Nicodemus, he wasn't part and parcel to what they were doing with Jesus. And there were others as well from the Sanhedrin that did not agree with anything that they were doing. And, you know, some scholars even write that like Nicodemus and some of the others weren't present even at this council during the third trial of Jesus Christ. And they only brought forward the ones that were in favor of destroying Jesus Christ. But from the narratives and what we see in the Greek language, it says they all were there. So, again, uh, uh, and it also said they all agreed to find him guilty. But we know that individuals like Nicodemus, we think Joseph of Arimathea, he might have uh, uh, been, uh, he certainly was a believer, but he might have uh, been part of the council too. But he, not all of them agreed, as we know. Now, whether they were there or not, uh, we'll only find out when we get to heaven. So uh, here in this narrative, what do we see? The council of the elders. Again, the presbyterian, and we've seen that before, and uh, that talks about the assembly of the elders of the presbytery. Later on in the New Testament, it talks about the local church leadership of any church. So you'd say the deacons, the uh, pastor, the president, uh, the secretary of the church, whatever the case may be. Okay, so you'd say the, uh, the the leaders of the church or the elders of the church. But at this point, this was the Sanhedrin that was there chief priests we've seen them time and time again as well as the scribes being there and just to remind you remember the scribes were the lawyers and also the secretaries or we could say the stenographers of these trials because they would have to write down everything that was said and done and put it into their records uh, uh, for historical basis and uh, for record's sake as well 
So as we look at all of this, remember the council chambers. We, uh, I've shown you this map before, and let me see if I can get my pointer going again. But remember, in the old city of Jerusalem, down here at the bottom left-hand corner, this was the palace of Caiaphas, where he and Annas uh, lived at that point in time in different dwellings, but in that entire complex. And we see the courtyards around it. And one of those courtyards is where Peter denied Jesus Christ three times. From there, then, they traveled all the way up through. And remember, this is where Herod resided, which was, uh, excuse me, the original Herod the Great built this tapel temple or palace for himself and that was his dwelling but at this time now Pontius Pilate was dwelling in that place and any of the uh, Roman dignitary that would come down from Rome would be staying in this place during their visits because over here was Herod the Tetrarch again he didn't have responsibility over Jerusalem, but the Galilean region to the north, he still had this palace over here now. But Herod the Great had built this, and now the Roman dignitaries, like Pilate, would stay there. So in any case, they had to pass by all of this, make their way up into the Temple Mount, and here we see the temple with the tabernacle, but below this we have some inner rooms, and right about here, as I'll show you on the next slide, right about this area, uh, down in one of the lower levels, we see where the Jewish council or chamber was. <coughs> and inside that Temple Mount uh, structure, this is where we would see a room. And in that room, again, we would see the Sanhedrin. Again, the Jewish leaders, the elders, uh, the Pharisees. Some were Pharisees, some were Sadducees. Remember, there were two different sects uh, of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Uh, they would be there. The high priest would be sitting up here on his little, uh, little throne. Uh, Jesus would have been standing down here. And then down here we have the tables for the clerks. And uh, some of the scribes would be in those positions, again, to write things down and uh, to do the, uh, the magistrate of, uh, of the courtrooms. As you can also see, let me get my pointer going again, down here on the map to the bottom right, here is where we see this chamber being located in regard to the tabernacle. Okay, Remember the altar, the brazen laver, the holy, of, uh, the holy place, and then the holy of holies in the back room there. But this is where that chamber, which is called the chamber of hewn stone, okay, that would have been down there, and that's where these proceedings would have been held. And as you can see from this, there were 35, excuse me, uh, there were 70 members that made up this council. Kind of reminds us of our, our Senate or the Congress, as we would have today, uh, with members on the right, members on the left, okay? They had their Pharisees on the right, the Sadducees on the left, or vice versa, whatever the case may be. And uh, they then would make decisions of consequence for the people and nation of Israel. All right, so that's where the trials uh, would be going on. That's where the council chambers were. <coughs> and uh, this, uh, again, is mentioned uh, several times throughout the New Testament. Again, this council chamber and the council before us. But again, the scribes, the Pharisees, the, the uh, chief priests and the elders, they've all been defined before. We saw them back in verse 2 that made the deal with Judas Iscariot, the, uh, the chief priests and the scribes. We saw the elders also being included in verse 54, coming against Jesus Christ. So here we are with the culmination of their act to find him guilty to try to get rid of him. All right, now jumping down to verse 67, the question that they asked is, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. You will not believe, even if I do tell you. You're asking me to tell you, and you know we're before the court. According to the law, everybody that's in the court has to tell the truth. They cannot lie. And if they are lying, you have to prove that in some way, form, or fashion with other evidence or witnesses, etc., etc. Here I am telling the truth, but you will not believe me. He knew it. And again, we find out that even though he did tell him the truth, and it's interesting how he does it. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Even though I tell you the truth, you will not believe. So they asked him, 
are you the Christ? And again, Christos is the Greek word. We've seen that. It means the anointed one. It was a phrase that meant the, the Messiah as well, the promised Messiah that they were looking for, not only in the sacrifice of their sin as the suffering servant, but also the king of Israel that would usher in the glorious uh, kingdom age that they all were waiting for as well. And so are you that guy? Are you that one? Interesting enough, when we have the if here, and I gave you the detail in your notes, but this first if is what we call a first class conditional if, which means if and you are for the sake of argument. So it's interesting, first class conditional if, if and you are, okay, but yet none of them were believing that he was, okay, so kind of throw that one right out the door, but it's still uh, if and you are, but for the sake of argument, tell us that you are. Then Jesus replies, if I tell you, you will not believe me. There in the Greek construction, because remember, there are four different classes of if statements in the Greek language compared to the English language. But if I tell you, you will not believe me, that if statement is what we call a third class conditional if. And with that, it's maybe I will tell you, maybe I won't tell you. But at the same time, if and I do tell you, maybe you will believe, but maybe you will not, with the emphasis on maybe you will not. Because what he uses here in the construction is a double negative. He uses the one, uh, ook, and then he uses may, the two different negatives in the Greek language. Not, not, we would never say that. We'd not put a double negative uh, together in our English language. But in the Greek they did for added emphasis. Absolutely not. So Jesus Christ saying, if I do tell you, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But the fact is, you will not believe me. And again, absolutely you will not believe me, even if I do tell you. So interesting use of the if statements between the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and Jesus' response. How they use a the first class, he uses the third class, but also recognizing that they would not believe. And that's his initial response. If I tell you, you will not believe. You will not believe me. Even though I am here and by the law, I need to tell the truth. And I've been saying this to you over and over and over again. But even if I do tell you right now that I am the Christ, you're not going to believe me. <laughs> so, in other words, why should I say it in, in another way? But yet he did. And he did in a fantastic way, as we're going to see in the next passage. So, in the previous scene, Jesus asked the disciples, or in a previous scene, I should say, you know, before they even came into Jerusalem, Jesus Christ asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And then he also asked, who do the people say that I am? And then we see the disciples' response, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the one that we've been waiting for. So it's interesting that prior to entering into Jerusalem, the disciples and the people that were following Jesus Christ in those different regions and at that time were absolutely believing that he was the Christ, he was the Messiah, he was the Savior. But now when he's in front of the religious leaders, they're not going to believe that he is the Christ, even though they ask him, are you the Christ? Are you the one? Tell us if you are. And yet he says, I can tell you, but you're not going to believe me. So we see that prior... Uh, reference into our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the people, the prior belief by the apostles, by the, uh, the, the, the followers of Jesus as well in Matthew, Mark, and the Gospel of Luke, where they said, yes, you are the Christ, the Son of God. So then as we get down into uh, the next verse, again, as Jesus says, you will not believe, you will not pastuo me, you will not have faith. Uh, so therefore, you know, should I really bother at this point? But yet, He's going to give them the answer anyway. Then he goes on in to continue this discussion and says, And if I ask a question, you will not answer. There, too, is a third-class conditional if. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. If I do, but maybe I won't, you will not answer my question. So now Jesus Christ is saying, hey, you know, if you're going to ask me a question, you want me to respond, but yet if I ask you one, you're not going to respond. What is Jesus Christ doing here at this point in time? 
He's trying a case. He's trying a case. You see, when we come back on Thursday and I give you the 16 to 18 plus points of the illegality of these trials, one of them is that Jesus Christ was not represented by a lawyer. He had nobody to represent him. And he was representing himself. And so, by law, this trial was illegitimized because Jesus did not have counsel. Nobody to speak for him. By law, the accused did not need to answer a question. So again, illegitimizing. So, interesting enough, as Jesus Christ is now asking, you know, if I ask you a question, you're not going to answer my question. He basically is being his own lawyer and defending himself in this court of uh, public opinion, as it were. Okay, So in any case, it's interesting. If I ask a question, you will not answer my question either. Third class conditional if, and we have the double negative, ook may, you absolutely will not answer my question either. And we find that because Jesus Christ says who he is, and yet all they do is want to accuse him and condemn him at that point in time. So, in essence, he's saying, why should I answer your question when you will not answer mine? But what he's doing is showing the mockery of this court according to the law at the same time. Now, in verse 69, it says, But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So this is Jesus' response to their question. Are you the Christ? And he doesn't come out and say, yes, I am at this point. Okay, He's going to in just a minute, but to an act, a, a slightly different question. But in regard to being the Christ, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And so this is actually Jesus' response to their questioning. And what does Jesus do here? He doesn't use his own words. He quotes Scripture. He quotes Scripture. And I find that very interesting. And, you know, think about that sometimes in your life when people may be accusing you or questioning you about this, that, or the other thing, or, you know, why are you doing this or why are you doing that? <clears throat> you know, it always helps to have Scripture in the back of your mind and just lay that down rather than your own words. And when that happens, now they can't do what? They can't accuse you of what you said and what they are doing then if they deny it or accuse they're accusing God and they're accusing his word or they're doubting God and they're doubting his word so it's always good to have scripture in the mentality of your soul and as we see throughout the New Testament you don't always have to quote it absolutely perfectly okay but when you know the concept and content behind it and you know, you know uh, what it's all about, then you can use it. You can even paraphrase it if you like. And you can say, Scripture says, and you can paraphrase if that makes sense for that situation. Our Lord actually does that here. He's quoting Scripture, but he's paraphrasing at the same time in regard to his situation. So... What our Lord is doing here is going back to a prophecy found in Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. I'm going to show you that on the board in a couple of slides here. To reveal that, yes, he is the Christ. Yes, he is the Messiah. But he does it in a very interesting way, in a very fantastic way, where it is in regard to the session of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what is this also doing? This is also placating to really what they were looking for. They were looking for the Messiah to come and establish his kingdom. The Messiah to come and, again, wipe out the world forces and establish Israel as a nation once again. And that would only happen when a son of David, a son of God, would come onto the scene and that individual would be seated at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenly places. And that is what Jesus Christ uh, did. That's how he responded. And oh, by the way, that's where he is residing right now. Although he's everywhere at the same time because he is God. Okay, But in any case, it speaks to the session or what we call the session of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, he was crucified, he died on the cross, was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead, he was resurrected. And then... Uh, 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 
Ten days after that, I always get com confused sometimes. Ten days after that, he ascended into heaven. Forty days after that, came back the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he ascended, and then upon his ascension, he then was seated at the right hand of God the Father, and that's when, quote unquote, his session began especially the humanity of Jesus Christ. Again, the deity of Christ was always on the throne with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, Trinity in one. But the Son of God that took on humanity was then seated at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenly places, and now he is seated there, as the Scripture tells uh, us, until all his enemies are placed in subjection under his feet. That will begin to be fulfilled in the second advent of Jesus Christ, which over the past year uh, we studied intensely as we studied the uh, sealed judgments in the book of Revelation uh, to some degree and recognized the session of our Lord where he will come back and establish his millennial reign here on planet Earth. And then after that, after 1,000 years, it goes on to the eternal glory with the new heavens and a new earth, and he will rule and reign for all of eternity seated at the right hand of God the Father. So that's how Jesus Christ responds. He doesn't say, I am in this case, but the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. I'm going to kind of leave it there for a minute and uh, come back to that. Uh, but we also see him saying the same phrase with the same questioning back, as I said, uh, as Matthew and Mark do the conglomeration or the amalgamation of all three of these trials into one. We see that paralleled back in Matthew 26, 64, and then also in Mark chapter 14, 62. These all come, as I said, from Psalm 110, verse 1. We're going to note that. And then certainly the Apostle Paul used it in his writings in Ephesians, Colossians, and we believe he was the writer, or at least the, uh, the thinker behind the book of Hebrews. Somebody else might have penned it uh, as, a, uh, as a scribe. But in any case, uh, we see this phrase being used throughout the New Testament so that we recognize the session of our Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father in eternal glory, in rule and authority forever and ever and ever. And so when we look at the prophecy from the passage, going back to Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, there it says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So what our Lord uh, Jesus Christ does was take this, but also says, when you're going to see this, seated at the right hand of God coming in his glory. So as I said, at the power of God, and again, to be at the right hand of God, it means that's the place and position of power and authority. That's why, again, he could paraphrase and utilize the word dunamis or uh, dunamai here uh, in uh, Luke's gospel to say at the right hand of the power of God. Because that's what it means. And then the last part, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You see, he is in his session now. And he will continue in that session until all enemies are placed in subjection under our Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what the last enemy is? Death and sin. The sin leads to death. And even when that is done away with at the great white throne judgment of Jesus Christ, where he throws all unbelievers and Satan and all the fallen angels away in the lake of fire for all of eternity, sin and Satan and death will be removed for all of eternity. And everything will be placed in subjection at that time. Right now, these things are running rampant uh, throughout our world and throughout our country, as we know. But the Lord says, sit at my right hand. And again, there's a whole nother, I could spend a lot more time on this. The Lord says to my Lord, okay? Jesus Christ utilized that phraseology in another discussion. You know, it can't be David talking because the Lord said to my Lord. And David is speaking here. That Lord said to my Lord. So God the Father said to God the Son. It's the only way to interpret it. And Jesus was trying to prove that out to the people so that they would recognize he is the God the Son. And again, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at my feet. 
So the session of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began after he ascended to heaven in the presence of all the apostles. That is noted at the end of the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, and then in the beginning portions of the Gospel, excuse me, not the Gospel, but the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 2. And then we see uh, the literal uh, uh, ascending of our Lord in chapter, uh, excuse me, in verse 9 uh, and verse, uh, through verse 11. So in chapter 1, we see these things happening. When Jesus Christ ascended, then he took his session. He took his seat. And those other New Testament passages that talk about that that I uh, showed you are also interesting in nature, where it really talks about the first one where the Father seated him at his right hand. But then kind of after that, all the other references, it says Jesus took his seat. Jesus sat down. He took the throne. So again, recognizing that he is God and that he basically is taking his seat on high in majesty, now in hypostatic union. So again, that whole phrase, we could spend a lot of time on that all by itself, but that's another doctrine for another day. But that is the doctrine of the session of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is what he's bringing as his defense and as his witness to these individuals. He quotes scripture. And what else happens when you quote Scripture? And rather than giving people a direct answer, it makes them stop and think, right? And again, this is a problem I have because any time anybody asks me a question, I want to answer directly, okay? Yep, but, 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 is this, that, and the other thing. I want to be direct, okay? But sometimes that's not the best way to go. Sometimes it's better to be general and give an answer like our Lord did here where it is an affirmative answer, but it gives a little bit more context to the answer so they have to stop and think about it. And that's what these individuals had to do. They had to say, well, wait a minute. This guy just quoted Psalm 110. We know that from Scripture. That the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the enemies a footstool for your feet. That talks about the session of our God, our Messiah, the promised one. So they had to think about that. And they had to put two and two together. He's saying, and, and Jesus Christ actually doesn't say here, this is me. He's saying, this is how you're going to see this person. But he also gives the understanding where, again, back in verse 69, the Son of Man will be seated. And throughout his ministry, Jesus Christ talked about the Son of Man and referred that to himself. And in fact... I gave you this in the notes as well. I won't go into too much detail here. Jesus Christ utilizes the phrase Son of Man for himself more than he does the Son of God. And then actually, there's only two, maybe three places within the New Testament where Jesus says, I am the Son of God, or uses that phrase or title, the Son of God, in reference to himself. All the other times that the Son of God, which is used throughout the Gospels, uh, as we see numerous times, all the other times it's other people, whether it be a demon uh, or Satan himself, calling Jesus Christ the Son of God, or whether it be man. So I found that very interesting that uh, uh, Jesus Christ utilizes that title for himself. And then my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. He said the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And he knows that they know that he's been identified as the Son of Man. And he is the legitimate uh, authority to the throne of Israel as the Son of David, being the Son of God as well. So he makes them think about all of this. And what is he doing? He's presenting the gospel message. That's the gospel message. And he's presenting it from a place that they are more enticed about. You see, they didn't want a Messiah to come and die for their sins, okay? Totally rejected that in Jesus Christ. But they were looking for that warrior king to come and establish the millennium and then the kingdom of God for them. So he presents the gospel from their perspective, the session of Jesus Christ, where all the enemies will be placed at his feet. So they had to think, and they did think about it. So he answered in such a way designed to further reveal who he is, talked about his nature, talked about his mission, and especially is giving it. He's giving it to them all, 
giving them all an opportunity to hear the gospel in that realm. Because remember, that passage is chock full with the Messiah, okay? And they recognize that passage of prophecy for the Messiah, the Christ. And so he does it for them all, but especially for those who may just want to believe, okay? And even those who do believe and are not going along with all the shenanigans that are happening during these trials. So again, Jesus Christ positions it in such a way where he delivers the gospel. His reply was a reference to his coming resurrection, ascension, and then glorification. As also speaks in the book of Acts chapter 7, 56, and also in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 15 in verse 25. So Jesus Christ is giving answers, even though he knows that most of them, if not all of them at this council at this time, would not believe, but yet he's giving them the truth as he was supposed to under the law in a trial. And now he's leaving it into them to either choose for or against, either believe or to reject. And that's why we see now, as I taught, was it Sunday, on the common and efficacious grace of God, the Holy Spirit, and the ministry, the convicting ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, to a lost and dying world, to the unbelieving world. Here, we see it in action, because the common grace ministry of the Holy Spirit is working as Jesus Christ delivers the gospel, just as you deliver the gospel in some form or fashion to the people of the world, and let them sit and think about it. Now it's the Holy Spirit's ministry to make that gospel information understandable so they can recognize what it means and what it means for them, what it means about God and Jesus Christ, and now leave them with a choice to either believe it or to reject it. In the common grace ministry of God the Holy Spirit, in this scene, the Holy Spirit did his job too. He did his job too. And how do we know that? by the response from the Sanhedrin. And as we look, and uh, let's go back into verse 70. Let me read it there. It says, And they all said, I love how it says, They all said, Are you the Son of God then? You see, that's their response to seated at the right hand of God the Father. You see, they put two and two together. You see, the Son of Man seated at the right hand of, of God meant that this is the Son of God. And if he's the Son of God, he's the Savior, he's the Messiah. And so they asked the question, are you the Son of God then? Because they knew that those scriptures from an intellectual standpoint, even though they weren't believing upon Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of those scriptures. So the common grace ministry of God the Holy Spirit made the gospel understandable to them. Now they can either choose to believe or choose to reject. It's in their free will hand now. But the gospel is understandable. And the person that is fulfilling uh, the gospel message is right in front of them. So they understood the meaning of his first response, again, through the common grace ministry of God the Holy Spirit. But unfortunately, because of their negative volition towards the word of God, they didn't want to believe it. And kind of what's interesting as well, in their question, are you the Son of God then? What are they doing? He gave them Scripture to believe in. Now they're not saying, okay, let me say yes or no to that Scripture. Let me ask you a different question. And let me get that response from you. So what they're doing now is they don't want to reject the Word of God, okay? They don't want to re reject the Scripture of Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. They don't want to say no to Scripture. You see, Jesus put them in a tight spot. Okay? He put them in a tight spot. If you're saying no, you're saying no to the Word of God. You're not saying no to me. You're saying no to the Word of God. And again, have that in your thoughts, too when you are witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ or delivering any aspect of the Word of God. 
Remember, it's not you that they're rejecting, but the Word of God that they're rejecting. So again, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to feel self-conscious about it. You don't have to think, that, oh, I must be a bad witnesser, or I must be a bad this, or uh, they don't like me here, they don't like me there. You don't have to worry about any of that, because it's not you. It's the Word of God that they are rejecting. So these Pharisees are, again, sly and tricky as we know. They put two and two together of what the Son of Man was all about, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and came up with a conclusion of, oh my God, that must be the Son of God that he's talking about. Are you the Son of God? And they ask him that question so they don't have to say no to the gospel prophecy of Psalm chapter, again, 110, verse 1 in the greater content meaning in when you compare Scripture with Scripture around all the Messiah passages. So again, they did not not want to believe the Scriptures. So they didn't want to reject the Scripture, but they wanted to reject Him, and that's what they continued on. So instead, what did they want? They wanted personal incrimination by Jesus Christ. They wanted Him to lay down the evidence to find Him guilty. As we've seen, they could never find any information of guilt about him. A lot of false witnesses came forward. And as we know, according to the law, those false witnesses should have received what Jesus received, called death. Okay, Because a false witness, according to the law, takes on the penalty that the accused is accused of and, and the punishment for that crime. The false witness is to take that on, as we talked about uh, this past week as well. Again, as I said, imagine if we had that in our court system today. If you're going to lie before court, you perjure yourself. You don't just get a slap on the wrist and spend a night in jail in a fine of 150 bucks or whatever the case may be. I, d I don't know what the, the sentence is for that, for perjury. Okay. No, you get the sentence that this person would have got if they were found guilty. Now let me see a lie in the courtroom be a little bit different, don't you think? Well, now let me see a lie before Congress or the Senate, because that too is a courtroom in our country as well, or before the, the uh, Supreme Court. Whatever the case, let me see you do that. See, God is so smart. <laughs> if we would just follow the principles of our Lord and our God, again, in the court systems and trials, how much better would it be for the citizenry who is abiding by the law but instead, in Satan's cosmic system, we placate the sinner and we allow them to abuse society and be a detriment to society and a hurt to those who are law-abiding citizens. Okay, I'll get off that soapbox. All right. So they wanted him to personally incriminate himself and be the evidence because truly they couldn't find any others. And as we said on Sunday, remember, only two people came together. Wait, wait, wait. I, said it. I heard him say he'd destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. But you know the abuse of that. that. He wasn't talking about that temple building. He was talking about him. I'll raise it up on the third day in resurrection, which he did. So they put together all by themselves. I shouldn't say all by themselves, but through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, working in them for a convicting ministry. And remember, for the unbeliever, that's the only time the power of the Holy Spirit will work in their soul to give them understanding of the gospel message. They put together the Son of Man seated at the right hand with the Son of God. God the Holy Spirit connected the dots so they would know the gospel of Jesus Christ and that this person was the fulfillment of that gospel, standing right before you. Yet they did not believe. They still did not believe, and they didn't want to believe. They didn't want to believe from day one. And they rejected, rejected, rejected. And this is their crescendo of their, you know, big plan to get rid of Jesus. This is it. This is our time. Let's do it. Let's get rid of this guy. But then Jesus responds to even that question. So there's no shadow of a doubt of their guilt of the unpardonable sin called unbelief in Jesus Christ. Again blaspheming God the Holy Spirit, as we talked about on Sunday. It's rejection of Jesus Christ. 
and the rejecting of his convicting ministry to teach you that Christ is the Savior. He is the Messiah. So Jesus Christ responds in another great moment, I am. And as I've said to you before, that statement alone, are you the Son of God? I am. When Moses went up on the mountain and, and you know, uh, spoke with God in that mountain through the burning bush, Moses said, who should I tell them? You know, the people, you know, you're going to send me into these people to save them and be their deliverer from the Egyptians. What's your name? You know, they're going to ask me, what's the God's name? What's his name? And God responded, and again, I'd say Jesus Christ, that theophany of the burning bus, I am. I am that I am, and I am sent you. So when Moses goes back to the people of Israel, he says, I am sent me, the eternal one, the existing one. I am sent me, and that's his name. And so from that day forward, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also became known as the great I am. And when Jesus Christ came onto the world, as I've shown you, you know, we have the seven great I am statements, but there's, you know, a, a title, a definition after it as well. I am the door, I'm the shepherd. All the other ones that go along with that. I'm all of those. But the I am comes first. And then there's all these other statements where he says, I am. And remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came to arrest him. Are you Jesus of Nazareth? I am. And they all fell to their knees. <laughs> they fell back and fell to their knees. Fell to the ground at the statement, I am. And it was a little bit more than just the shock and awe of the I am and the meaning and intent behind it. But again, part of the placing under subjection at the feet of Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. See, they got a glimpse of that when they arrested Jesus in the garden. As they fell to their knees, they were at his foot. All the enemies were at his feet for a brief moment. And we talked about them picking themselves back up and continuing on. Even though they had the message right there, they continued to arrest him. Once again, now Jesus does it before the whole council, the Jewish leadership. I am. I'm the son of man, an epitaph for the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ. Uh, you will see me seated at the right hand of God the Father. They know he's God and the son of God, the son of David. And then he comes out plainly, are you the son of God? Yes, I am. I am. And it's all right there before them. Again, have to tell truth in the trial, according to Israel. And here's Jesus, who never broke a law. Never broke a law. And yet, they think he's going to be lying at this point in time? I mean, if they knew anything about him, they knew he was not a liar or a swindler or a cheat. They just didn't like his rebuking of their ministry and of their falsehood of the religion that they had twisted it around into. But in any case, the response is another great I am statement. And then as we wrap it up in verse 71, it says, Then they said, What further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And here's basically that statement is saying he's a blasphemer. He's a blasphemer. And we talked about that on Sunday and uh, last week as well. He's a blasphemer, and that's what they found him guilty of. Because he says that he is God. And clearly he is not God, according to them. <laughs> Even though he's shown signs, miracles, and wonders, and had fulfilled all the suffering, ser well, was about to fulfill a lot of the suffering servant aspects, but he filled all the aspects of what the Messiah would be. Yet they were not believing. And the entire council, then they said, what further? They're all coming together, and basically they're saying, case closed and in essence they're saying that Jesus Christ is condemning himself and has condemned himself because he's saying he's God he's God he's blaspheming because he's not God according to us and as he assumed they did not believe him even though 
he told them the truth. It went just as he said. Even if I tell you, you will not believe. Pastuo, the Greek word, you will not have faith. You will not believe. You will not accept it. Even if I do tell you, and I've just told you, from prophecy, from the convicting ministry of God the Holy Spirit, of you putting two and two together to figure out, are you the Son of God? Yes, I am. And I've said it. But you still are not believing. And oh, by the way, when we're talking about a courtroom, what evidence did they present that he was not who he said he was? That never happened. <laughs> they just accused him. He's a blasphemer. What more do we need to do? He said it himself, that he is the Son of God. Well, you're in a courtroom, and the defendant has a right to defend themselves. He didn't have a lawyer like he should have had, but he's acting in his own uh, benefit as his own lawyer. Where's the evidence from the other side that he is not what he said he was? You see, that, again, le illegitimized this whole trial because they didn't have alternate evidence to prove without a shadow of a doubt that he is not who he said he was. Nor did they have discovery of further evidence as to who he is claiming to be. None of that was presented, which could have been presented if it was a legitimate courtroom, not a kangaroo courtroom could have presented legitimate evidence. And if they had, you know, any ounce of integrity in them whatsoever, they would have said, okay, we have to discuss all of this. He is saying that this is who he is. Is there corroborating evidence to that? Is there refuting evidence to that? So that we can come to a final conclusion and decision. But like kangaroo courts are designed to do, the verdict was in before the trial began. <laughs> He's already guilty before he even gets there. And regardless of what happens in this courtroom, he's still going to be guilty. So again, that's what happened during this trial by the Sanhedrin. Even though the truth was there, they still found him guilty. And the next scene that we're going to talk about, which I uh, assume we'll pick up on Thursday, but uh, Thursday I'm going to give you the, uh, uh, the illegitimacy of this trial in uh, some detail. But basically, they find him guilty here, again in the kangaroo court. Now they drag him off to Pilate to get rid of him. I'm going to show you some interesting things in regard to that as well uh, in the next week or so. But in any case, what our Lord did was fantastic. He presented the gospel, let the Holy Spirit do his work too. The convicting ministry gave them all another opportunity for salvation before many of them, I believe, would seal their fate. Because as the word of God says, the conscious is sealed when people are so in uh, negative and so far in apostasy and so far in unbelief against God and Jesus and the Messiah. Yeah, as long as they're alive, there's always hope for another day for salvation. But sometimes the conscience gets so seared, as with a branding iron, the Scripture tells us, that sometimes there's no going back. God gives opportunity to go back, but again, it's hard work to go back. And people just don't want to do that because they want to reject, they want to reject for whatever reason. And in their case, their little fiefdom, their little gold mine that they had called their Jewish religion in Israel. They sealed their fate when they rejected Jesus Christ yet once again. But he gave them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And the rejection of Jesus Christ, let me just close with this, as calling him the Son of God, guess what? The blasphemes we talked about that happened while he's on the cross, that phrase comes up again. If you are the Son of God, save yourself. But you're not, because you're not saving yourself. See, we were right. And they blaspheme against Jesus time and time again. They show their negative volition, their unbelief, and their seared conscience towards him. That was developed by their own free will volition, led by Satan and his cosmic system, but ultimately their own free will. But even in that, 
Jesus always gives them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. So any unbelievers in your life that have rejected, 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 yes, it may be hard for them to believe one day because of their sad conscience, but don't ever give up hope. If they're alive today, there's another opportunity for salvation because, again, God can cut away. That's what the circumcised heart is all about. He can cut away all that scar tissue so that they will be saved. All right, so let's close. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and the great endurance that he had to go through these things, but also the great love that he had, even for these people that were abusing it and accusing him. We thank you, Father, for that love that has been shared to us and presented to us and now expressed on us through our own personal salvation. And Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to share in that. And we ask for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.